All right. Well, uh, we'll get started. Uh, thanks. Thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, my name is Bob Bryan. I'm the Senior Director of Advisory Services here at the Drummond Group. Um, and with me today are two of our senior advisory consultants, uh, Greg Romania and Jim Dow. Um, so we're looking forward to having a good discussion for the next half hour. Um, the, uh, this will last about 30 minutes, um, we, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. So if you have questions uh, during the discussion, go ahead and insert them in the chat. Um, and we'll we'll save some time at the end to pick up those questions. If, if for some reason we don't get to your question, we can also follow up with you after. Uh, so anyway, uh, thanks a lot for joining. And we're looking forward today to talking about uh, integrating compliance requirements uh, with your product roadmap. And the context of this is that we're, we're talking about compliance requirements for certification of health IT. Uh, the ONC certification requirements that health IT products follow, uh, primarily around security and interoperability requirements. Uh, and we, we wanted to get into this topic today because, partly because of the HTI-1 proposed rulemaking that the ONC issued back in April. Um, that, that proposed rulemaking came out at that time, uh, and the comment period closed in July. So we're expecting to have a final rule by the end of this year. That's not definite, but judging from the timelines that were listed in the proposed rule, we would expect to have a final rule by the end of this year so that developers have a year or two years, depending on the particular requirements, uh, in order to basically get the work done and meet the deadlines. Uh, so um, we have been investing our time in looking at what is basically a two-year roadmap uh, of requirements uh, that are ahead for developers under that rule and under some related rulemaking from CMS. And we wanted to get into talking about that some today. Uh, so just to start out, uh, Jim and Greg, uh, how do you see developers approaching the next two years with their product roadmaps and their overall design and planning around certification requirements that they need to bring in to their product plan? Yeah, I don't know if you want me to go first, Jim, but, you know, one of the things I would, would say is, you know, the information that we present today is going to show some regulatory activities that are happening, like you just mentioned, with HTI and several other regulatory activities that are really going to drive different standards and different use cases in the near future. And they're, you know, all going to require uh, a plan to develop the products. Um, so I think this information is definitely going to be useful and something that developers will really, would really need to immerse themselves in to get a picture of what they're up against over the next couple of years. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that I've been doing is um, in anticipation of the, the final rule is uh, doing some more deeper analysis of the uh, HTI-1 proposed rule from the mindset of an engineering manager, product manager, uh, compliance uh, manager, starting to really put together concrete uh, development plans and to outline what's going to be required uh, in regards to compliance uh, to uh, build in new requirements, uh, change requirements. And then obviously you have to blend that in with your normal uh, enhancements, updates, um, and what your customers have been asking for in terms of, of that. So it's really the blending of those. Um, we're getting a good handle on um, 
what could be involved. And uh, it really comes down to uh, two major buckets, uh, phases of, of uh, potential uh, development. Um, one would be um, in the year 2024 to meet a um, January 1st, 2025 uh, deadline for all the criteria updates um, uh, related to U.S. City I version 3, fire updates, um, new minimum uh, code value sets that are required, and the uh, new uh, companion guide for clinical notes, um, CCDA uh, updates. So all those are going to impact uh, deadline by the end of 2024. Second group, um, the deadline is going to be January 1st, 2026, that your product has to be updated and uh, certified available for uh, patient restricted access updates to um, a lot of demographics related to um, gender identity. So those are the two major lifts for for those those two years. And with the US CDI version three. Uh, with those particular requirements, are, are those touching a lot of uh, existing criteria? Um, it, it does. There, um, we're putting together um, templates that we hope will we'll be uh, helping customers uh, start with a uh, work breakdown structure and which criteria are affected. So there, there are um, sixteen criteria affected by that first phase, um, most of that being US CDI version three. Um, any, obviously any inter interoperability criteria are affected by that. And uh, I know that there are also, you mentioned one implementation guide, but there are several new implementation guides that are being adopted as standards. Um, so how will those play in to development planning? Yeah, the, the, the biggest impact are going to be the uh, companion guide, um, CCDA template clinical notes companion guide, uh, release 4.1, we believe is going to be adopted in the final rule. Um, that's all about US City I3. That companion guide update is to provide um, all the new CCDA HL7 templates to reflect the use of US CDI version 3 elements. The other uh, companion guide that will be the major impact is going to be the FHIR US Core 6.1. And the same, it, it's the same game. It's all uh, tracking the effects of the US CDI version 3. So th those are the two major changes. There are other implementation guides. Um, uh, that are going to affect, for example, F5, uh, F5 uh, case reporting. Uh, it's no longer use whatever standard or format you want. There's now um, standards required for the uh, code sets and triggering of, uh, of um, that information. So, And, and Greg, I, kn I know you've you've spent some time digging in on the fire side of the world. Um, so what are you seeing in terms of development planning around the changes that are coming relating to overall fire development for, for um, health IT? Yeah, I think the message that we're seeing from some of the other regulation is that uh, there's going to be other requirements outside of the ONC HTI regulation um, once it is adopted, that are going to impact development plan. Uh, currently, we're tracking tracking seven possible regulatory activities over the next couple of years. Uh, some examples of that are uh, CMS 9900, which is being driven by the No Surprises Act, and it's looking mm -hmm. to advance the uh, you know EOB and faith estimates for covered as entities. So, in other words. Looking to leverage the ONC established fire APIs in order to, to uh, build patient cost transparency. 
So that's a regulation right. that we see right now in the request for information status. You know, once we get through, well, the comment period has already ended. I think that one ended in November. Um, but that will certainly drive CMS requirements in the future. Uh, another example, uh, ONC uh, 0955 for electronic prior authorization. Here they're looking for or to gather public comments on, you know, implementation standards, future certification criteria, all centered around using APIs again to streamline the, the prior authorization process. And then another example is CMS um, 57. This is a proposed rule and also an RFI. And here they're looking at advancing interoperability and improving, improving prior authorization processes, uh, again, to further drive the use of APIs to facilitate more efficient processes like prior authorization. Uh, that one in particular, there's a lot of excitement about uh, a lot of potential savings in the healthcare industry by, by pursuing that particular functionality. And then obviously HTI1 plays into a lot of this um, development direction over time. Yeah, I know it's it's interesting with, with prior authorization because that's been one that, that the healthcare industry has been waiting for for a while because of the efficiencies that can be created if, if these prior authorization tasks can be automated between providers uh, and payers, uh, and it looks like that that CMS um, proposed rule will set a deadline at the end of 2025 for payers to have a provider access API, which means providers currently should be thinking about uh, essentially be what, what kind of client access they're going to have to that API and how they're gonna be able to consume that payer data that will be available for these back and forth uh, prior authorization transactions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, in HTI-1, we've also got an RFI where ONC is gathering information now on, specifically on prior authorization for e-prescribing. So it seems like we have this cycle of interrelated rulemaking that is rolling up um, over the next two years um, in sort of pushing towards that January 1 deadline, uh, the, that January 1, 2026 deadline, which is about two years out now. Um, so interesting to see how the two agencies are playing together. Right. And, and to add to your implementation guide question, each of these, you know, we're tracking uh, additional implementation guides that are going to be made available or are potentially available now, but uh, will be the de facto standard going forward. So those are other areas that we're digging into to understand how that applies to development developers in the development cycle. Yeah, it's uh, uh, interesting times. And, uh, and Jim, I, I wanted to go back to your comment about the, the two year cycle and what's coming in that first year. Yeah. What do you see as the big things um, that developers should be incorporating into their plan going into next year? Well, the the big rocks, uh, the obvious one is USGDI version 3, which yeah. uh, affects uh, 15 different criteria. And um, so that's, that's the big one. Um, and the challenge is going to be how, and that's why we are recommending a uh, like a two-year phased approach, um, because the challenge is going to be, uh, and we're going to come up with some uh, templates and some guidance on this, is uh, to maximize developers' work in a particular module or function, so that you know if they're making updates to uh, B1 transfer of care, they, they've got all the different requirements in, in front of them, you know, okay, we've got, we've got uh, vocabulary code updates, we've got US City I version three updates, we've got these uh, social determinants of health uh, additions, 
And then, oh, and then in uh, January 1, two, 2026, we have to accommodate patient restricted access. Um, mentioning patient restricted access, which is the heavy rock for uh, January 1, 2026 deadline, um, we're, we think that's going to be huge. Um, we're, we're excited to, excited and wish we could get a preview of comments coming in for the final rule because there were a lot of uh, a lot of comments by ONC in the proposed rule really wanting to know uh, get feedback from developers how they think this could work because it's there, there's so many potential challenges and issues of how granular do you make uh, allow patients to restrict access and to say, I, I don't want you to access any medications that have this particular ARC norm code. I mean, is, is it that level? And so there, there's a lot to be uh, determined. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why they put it out a ways, because I think even after the final rule, they'll be trying to figure out how, how to make that happen. Because uh, again, there's, no, there's not going to be any standard uh, the the uh, segmentation um, in um, I believe it's, it's B seven and eight. It's uh, totally separate. And they're trying to figure out uh, you know segmentation uh, standards can be used for this restricted patient restricted access, but it's not mandated. So it, there's a lot still to be uncovered by ONC, uh, um, but it's it's a fairly big. Um, development going on there because it, it affects E1 where patients will uh, have um, internet functionality to uh, make those determinations and request restrictions. Then then what do uh, products do that aren't certified to E1? You know, most are. Um, the D14, which is the new privacy and security measure, call patient restricted access still needs to be implemented. And so there has to be other ways for patients to be able to uh, communicate uh, to the uh, provider or hospital that they do not want this information um, exported. They don't want it showing on any patient's portal. They don't want an interchange between systems. So it, it's a big one. Yeah, and I I don't know if you've looked at this yet, but I, I know we've seen in some other rules that that the ONC will say, okay, make sure you have a function to do to let's say restrict patient access, allow patients to restrict access to a certain data set of right. data, but but they don't necessarily regulate how you manage those communications with patients. Right. They just want the function to be in the software. But but there are these other activities sort of outside the bounds of of the regulation that still have to be dealt with. Um, right. And that's that's where, you know, it's always been kind of the challenge where, you know, ONC is being generous in terms of uh, not mandating certain standards or telling people prescribing how to do implement requirements. Sometimes it would be nice. It's always nice if people just tell us. <laughs> tell yeah. us what standards to do. How do you want this done? And it seems like this is always comes up every time, uh, you know, there's an update uh, to the ONC certification program. Uh, it, it, you know, things like um, uh, access to patient health care information and, and some of these more nebulous uh, criteria where um, developers struggle with how to implement. So kind of what you're talking about, it's like, it, then there's all these operational issues uh, that people are going to have questions about. And, and I, uh, I know probably a question that's on a, on many developers minds as they look sort of down the road, we don't exactly know what the final rule is going to look like, but we can guess that it will maybe be 95% consistent with the proposed rule. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I know that we have the SVAP process, the, the standards uh, version advancement process that ONC allows. Um, uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on that and, and how that can smooth out development planning, um, particularly as customers look into next year with this likely US CDI uh, version three requirement? Yeah, so first of all, it is a voluntary process. So there's no requirement for a developer to follow or to use SVAP, but it would it could potentially work to a developer's advantage because they can develop to the new standards that are approved in SVAP way ahead of time, you know, way in advance of the regulatory requirements. So as an example, USCDI version one right now is what's regulatorily required, but um, recently USCDI version three has been approved through SVAP. And it's highly anticipated that that will be the new de facto standard in the new rule. Um, so, you know, developers developing to that standard, deploying it in their environment as a part of the real world, um, you know, conditions for maintenance of certification will allow them to get ahead of the curve and not wait to the last minute in order to, you know, be prepared to meet the regulatory requirement. Um, go ahead. Yeah, something, Bob. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it, it looks pretty clear that US CDI version three is coming. If there's yeah. anything that we saw in HTI one, yeah. I mean, we can see that for each of the implementation guides that they've announced, they, they identified a current version, but in each case, I think with the US core guide, the CCDA uh, companion guide, and then the smart V2 guide, mm -hmm. for each one of those, they said, we're probably going to adopt the next version of the guide, which moves to US CDI version three, which will likely come out before the final rule is announced. So right. at this point, everything okay. that we're hearing from ONC is saying, we're going to move to versions of these guides that incorporate version three. And uh, right now it looks like most of them are available through SVAP that we right. anticipate HTI adopting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I did want, we, we don't have a lot of time left, but I did want it to take the opportunity to specifically touch on B11, which is the decision support intervention previously clinical decision support under A9 Right. Um, and, and that's got a, a few elements. I think a lot of focus has been on what they're calling predictive BFI, um, which is, uh, looks like we have, maybe have a question. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Um, the, it's, it's, it's not a good webcast if you don't have one pet. Um, <laughs> sorry, this, this is live. So um, may I address that, Bob? Yeah, why don't you take that on? And uh, if you've got anybody yeah. else who wants to comment, that's fine too, Jim. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention was um, obviously a bit, the big buzz is uh, predictive support and uh, AI. But I want to make sure that everybody knows that there are a lot of enhancements and changes that everyone is going to have to address beyond um, um, the potential for this this AI. Um, every every developer is just, just a quick comment on that, Jim. I, I know in the rule there's a yes no answer that developers are going to have to give, right? On predictive DSI. So if they say yes, then there are some additional requirements for predictive DSI. But if right. they give a no answer, they still have to address the issues that you're talking about now. Correct. Yeah, if there's a no answer, they still have to now um, build in new triggers for uh, two more interactions, one for uh, UDIs, implantable devices, one for procedures. They also now have to um, provide functionality that when that uh, evidence-based intervention is displayed, they have to provide functionality to export that uh, the attributes and the values displayed um, in a computable format. 
So there, so there are quite a few changes beyond just the predictive. Um, yeah, that's that's good for developers to understand. And you know, certainly, if developers, development organizations are already looking at bringing in AI capabilities into their product. They should probably be looking at the predictive DSI requirements in HTI one now. Um, but even if you're not, there are decision support requirements that will be new coming in with this rule and should be incorporated into planning. Uh, the uh, uh, so um, we're we're close to out of time here. Um, the and, and I I guess to close, I wanted to just ask each of you, what are you focused on to try to help customers through this this two year planning cycle that's ahead? Uh, you what, you want to start there, Greg? or oh. go ahead, Jim? I, I stole it from the Greg. Sorry. Um, one of the things that as a former engineering manager, one of the things that I really am doing is uh, I want to translate um, all of these requirements that we're tracking uh, into some templates and, and uh, procedures for um, project managers so that we can come down with, uh, it'll be fairly generic because you have to build in some of your own uh, development uh, tasks going on. But even like a work breakdown structure uh, that addresses by criteria, uh, addressing everything that needs to be uh, addressed uh, in that final rule. So that, that's what I'm noodling on and, and coming up with some tools for. What about you, Greg? What's on your mind? Myself, you know, I'm following the fire progression. Currently, what what is you know being built into HTI one? Anything else other than HTI one, we're taking a look at, you know, understanding how it would drive a developer's roadmap so that they have a bigger picture or as big a picture as they can. So they're not missing any of the other requirements outside of HTI. Um, you know, along with Jim, we're looking at the IGs to make sure to understand them, how those particular elements apply to development cycles uh, and requirements that they need, you know, developers need to build into their plan. So that's where my focus has been. And, and I can say that that on my end, um, I'm always thinking about information blocking <laughs> and and we're also expecting some additional rulemaking and information blocking is kind of an umbrella over a lot of of these other rules that we're working with developers on. And so it's what looks like um, more specific enforcement guidelines that are probably coming in September, uh, mm -hmm. which will color how developers look at a number of these other requirements that they're working on. So these things all play in together and uh, it, it becomes a more complicated picture, particularly with the number of, of existing criteria that are affected by HTI-1 and you know, rulemaking that's coming from the OIG and CMS um, and the kind of complicated prior authorization picture. So uh, interesting times ahead. For sure. Uh, well, uh, I know uh, it seems like our time went by fast. It doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, thanks to everyone who joined today. If you do have questions afterwards, um, feel free to reach out to us. Um, uh, any of us, you can reach any of us, uh, bob.brian at drumgroup.com, greg.romania, jim.dow at drumgroup.com. Um, we're available to talk. Uh, and best of luck to all of you as you look down the road over the next two years in building these product roadmaps that build the certification life cycle into your product plans. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Thank you.